Would you be able to tell me about what males and females are and almost why they evolved? Or why do we have males and females now uh, in, in the evolutionary world? Sure. So in, in my other um, life, a- academic life, I, I do evolutionary work. Um, some of it related to sex differences, and I, I teach an undergraduate um, course on that. And um, all complex organisms that reproduce sexually have two sexes, males and females. Males are just standardly defined as individuals with smaller sex cells, sm- uh, sperm, where they generate a lot of them. And females have the larger sex cells, the ova or eggs. Um, and the purpose of the uh, sexual reproduction in, is the mixing of the genes. Mixing up the genes creates more variable immune systems, more variable traits that allows for better adaptation to all sorts of conditions. Interesting. So it, in terms of the differences, like it's interesting that it's such a small difference, the size in the sex cells, mm-hmm. if I'm right in saying that, that's small, you know, but then you kind of, it's like in, especially in our species, there are quite big differences in then how we look and different traits. So is that strange? Why is there such a difference if the actual sort of thing that defines male and female is kind of so small? Right. Yeah. So the gametes, you know, the, the sex cells, the eggs in, in the, in the sperm are small. Um, but it, it, sets a trajectory for the individuals who have lots of sex cells um, to compete for mates and get as many mates as they can get. Um, It's got lower investment type of strategy. And then those who invest more in uh, eggs, ova, so forth, internal um, uh, gestation for mammals, for example, their uh, bias toward lower levels of competition, although they still compete with one another, and um, higher choosiness in uh, picking mates. Now, it, it's, there's lots of variation uh, among that, but the, the small gametes kind of set the stage for the evolution of bigger sex differences related to competition and choice. Right. So, so f- you know, so males say in our, our species, they uh, they have they have more sex cells and lower investment in it, whereas the females are fewer. They need to invest more into it, and so and and you're you're saying there you went into, you know, it's also there's there's this element of now the males are going to have to compete, um, and they don't have to necessarily invest as much, whereas the females kind of have to do the opposite. So so would you be able to speak about like those dynamics? Uh, uh, what do they do in shaping how males and females are different and are they the only dynamics yeah they're they're not the, the only dynamics but but they're important ones um producing a lot of sex cells or sperm uh for for instance means that um the males have a, ha- a faster potential rate of reproduction relative to the females so if we look at elephants, for example, um, the females are going to gestate for about 22 months or so, and then they're going to suckle for several years after that. Uh, so they, they can reproduce, you know, one offspring every, you know, four, four or five years or so, whereas the males um, could stick around and help out when the baby's born, although they wouldn't make any difference. Um, the successful males can produce sire many more offspring during that same time span than uh, the females could. And that means that males who are more aggressive, trying to get multiple mates and so forth, have an evolutionary advantage over the guys who um, might stick around and invest. And, uh, well, you know, I suppose in our species, we do actually have a sort of at least a cultural tendency for monogamy. And I, I wonder how far that extends and even having pair bonds that last a long time, which mm-hmm. apparently I heard is rare in like mammals in the animal kingdom. So then why in us do we have this? Actually we do, the males would invest and they, they often stick around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's a great question. That is one thing that makes humans a bit odd uh, among 
uh, mammals where males typically don't do much. And even among primates where um, you do see male investment, the investment that a lot of guys give is, is much more extensive and um, longer. The monogamy thing is, is certainly true in Western culture where it's the, with uh, cultural mores and, and laws and stuff. It's a socially imposed monogamy. If we look at uh, traditional cultures, uh, polygamy is actually pretty common with, with the top 10 or 20% of the most successful guys will have uh, several wives. So you, you do have um, kind of a mix of things uh, across cultures. Yeah, we, we've argued that um, male parenting comes from an evolutionary history of a gorilla-like social structure rather than a chimp-like social structure going back 4 million years or so where the males, uh, the family structure was one um, dominant male, a few females and their offspring. So there, that was the basic family structure. And what we argue, and, and, and so male parenting protection and so forth has been around for millions of years from this view. And the thing that changed was that males began working together and kind of becoming more coalitional and integrated together. So if you put four gorilla uh, family groups together, you would have four males that could work together, but you also have a family structure and so forth that's very similar to what you see in traditional contexts. Right. So, so like that, um, having like a kind of family unit that's in, in a way like uh, a strange and unique thing. And, and is that, and you're saying that's kind of serving a similar role to why humans or, or, or primates might want to have groups in general? It's kind of protection that you just have a bigger unit that's constantly together. Am I like, like, like what you know, even like the family unit, as you bring up, okay. like there's not just pair bonds. Why, why is everyone sticking together? Right. Yeah. So the the pair bonds are uh, interesting and and important. Probably in a lot of primates, uh, when the males stick around, it is to protect the offspring from harassment and infanticide risks. So the protection factor is very important there. Um, for people, I think males can also um, contribute to offspring's later social competitiveness, skill development and so forth, and help them kind of get a place in society when they're, they're adults. So kid, kids who have both parents are really advanced. You know, to get back to the start, when you talked about the difference between males and females and the, the sex cells, I, I mean, you kind of said it's, to do with the size of the sex cells and and you didn't necessarily say it was like a male had to have more and smaller like other species where it's different and and why would that be the case like i think i've heard of where like the males can be actually smaller than the females and i'm just wondering like why that happens and mm -hmm. how sort of the roles can be reversed right so um going to the uh sex cells the sperm uh they're, they're smaller which means they're cheaper to, re, uh, to produce, and so you get a lot of them. And that's the advantage. They are smaller in lots and lots of them. Um, and so their opportunity, say, if they're just released like some fish in the water, probably how it initially evolved, um, you have lots and lots of sperm uh, that just increases the chances of hitting the lottery, kind of fertilizing um, an egg. Um, the eggs need to be larger because there has to be nutrients and other resources uh, there to <clears throat> um, facilitate early development before implantation, if you're a mammal, or early development um, within, within the egg itself. So one of the sexes has to provide those nutrients, which reduces the number of sex cells that they can produce. Um, but since they have nutrients in it, that gives them their advantage if they do get uh, fertilized. And yeah, in, in looking at just physical size, um, there are some species where males are bigger than females, where there's a lot of male-male competition, where there's a lot of physical fighting. Males tend to be bigger than females. Um, there's other species where the females might be bigger. And that could be because the male, uh, their selection for male agility or speed or something rather than physical 
fighting or just you know searching for females where you don't have to fight to compete and sometimes the the females are bigger because they produce bigger eggs or lots of eggs i mean i I wonder why this isn't the case for say humans like that that, that females are on average smaller uh, it, like I guess they would also care about what mates they have but whereas it seems that it's the males sort of competing and f fighting against each other for different females so you know do, do some of these elements still occur in, in like humans why why aren't females sort of competing or do they for for, for males um, females do do compete but um, getting back the the male males larger than females if you're looking at primates that's very consistently related to physical male male fighting and uh, polygyny so the most aggressive successful males have more mates than um, than other males if we go back to the fossil record that sex difference and physical size has been around for at least four or five million years so it's a long-standing um, difference now, females do compete with one another. They compete for boyfriends or husbands or other types of resources that are important to them or their kids. Um, but it typically doesn't escalate to, you know, harmful physical competition. It's more like social manipulation. It's called relational aggression, you know, backbiting each other, undermining one's um, social reputation, social support systems, so forth. So they can be quite competitive, but it's not as obvious. Mm, interesting. I guess with, with females, it's more excluding and, and sort of like implicitly pushing out other 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 mates, but you're not trying to like actually start, start fights. And I, I suppose with males, they wouldn't also, they wouldn't generally try and start fights if they can avoid it, although sometimes they, they do. But, but, you know, I guess in general, you don't want to, avert and to physical violence but sometimes it happens yeah. um i you know i'm i'm interested because you talk about size is one key difference between males and females um mm -hmm. what are some other differences i know your work focuses on, on brain differences and some of the key things there so what are some of the other differences and, and why do we have them yeah so some of the the other differences just related to the physical stuff um you know not only height and weight um uh, lean muscle mass, upper body is much bigger, much more lean muscle um, in men than women, lower body as well, but not, not quite as different. The uh, upper body skeletal structure is there. Um, men's upper body is built for use of um, blunt force weapons, clubs, you know, hitting and stuff and projectile weapons. And the, the, the structure of the arm and shoulder and stuff allows for um, the throwing of uh, you know rocks at your competitors and so forth, and that also leads to differences in um, brain organization for the brain systems that support these skills. So the systems involved in tracking objects moving in space, for example, or quickly reacting to somebody being aggressive to you and so forth, are larger or more integrated in men than women. Mm. you know i've i've heard that uh the the different streams of i think it's like perception like the dorsal and mm -hmm. the ventral like like so yeah. what versus i suppose where is different between males and females like so males are kind of focused on like things and i suppose is it where where things would be i'm not sure but but it's uh you know can you speak a bit about that and as well like um i know females are better at like language writing and speaking and males like mathematics so could you speak sure. about why we would have these differences right right yeah yeah good good question yeah so so there there are biases and attentional focus a lot of things that the guys are good at visual spatial skills navigation uh mentally manipulating the representations of objects understanding maps and you know the kind of geometric layout of large scale space um, and you know object processing how objects can be used as tools are all kind of a dorsal stream parietal um, network that's kind of what they're attending to um, the ventral stream is focused more on 
attention to the details of individual things like faces, facial expressions, and so forth. And that's integrated in with the language for humans with the language system and other systems um, that are associated with what we call folk psychology, emotional intelligence, social cognitive types of things like language, theory of mind, reading gestures, facial expressions, so forth. Women tend to do better on, on those types of things. Interesting. Um, a kind of a related thing is emotions. I've been thinking about this too, like uh, emotional regulation, the ability to like, you know, you, you, you argue, argue with someone, but then you can sort of stop that. Um, mm -hmm. So who, who's better at that, like males or females and, and why? Yeah, good question. Um, women report higher levels of emotional reactivity to a lot of uh, different things. They seem to be more emotionally sensitive to um, a lot of especially social issues. Um, I've argued that because the way they compete, relational aggression is very subtle. It can involve um, mixed cues. So somebody says something or has a particular facial expression that could be hostile or it could be doesn't mean anything. Um, having a lower threshold for emotional reactivity will focus you on that information and allow you to think about it and um, react to it. So the, the emotional responsiveness thresholds are different. Um, the, one, the one exception is probably status related anger where guys are more likely to react to um, being disrespected, for example. Interesting. So it depends on the, the scenarios. Okay. And and you said that like facial expressions. So am I right in saying that females will be better able to read facial expressions? Is that is that a, a big difference? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a big difference. You know, it's a modest difference. So, so they are um, better, the more subtle the facial expression, the better they are at picking it up. And they seem to be a little bit better at picking up women's facial expressions than than men's, although w women convey more information in there. Mm, interesting. I, on, I guess on this topic of brain differences, I'm interested in um, autism, and I think I might be wrong, but apparently it's more prevalent in males. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. So would you be able to speak about like what autism is and why that would show up? I mean, maybe even in general in the species, but like as a disorder and just, you know, what it is, why is it more prevalent in males? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it, it's probably a mixed bag there, but kind of a pure, relatively well-functioning individual with autism just basically doesn't read social cues very well. Um, they're not uh, making correct inferences about what other people are thinking or feeling, and they often have hard times reading subtle facial expressions or vocal intonation and those types of things. And so their folk psychology is not as well developed, which makes uh, social interactions very awkward uh, for them. If, if you have a pure type of autism, it's more likely to be a guy than a girl. Um, there are girls with autism, um, but they often have multiple other problems as well. So like, am I right in saying with then the males and that's that prevalence there, it's like about their focus on objects and where things are and that precision and that's, it's in a corner sort of that going to an extreme of being hyper focused on those kinds of objects and the mechanical, am I right in saying that? Would that, would that be off? Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's certainly, certainly part of it. More of a focus on um, the physical world and objects and things and that sort of thing. And sometimes a very astute understanding of those things mm. but at a cost to social right because i you know I, I i suppose that with facial expressions it's they're a bit more mixed and you're gonna have to integrate subtle related cues together and and it's going to depend on the circumstance so it's it's a little harder there's not like a, a fixed rule set by which you can sort of judge them yeah um mm. uh, you know i guess on this topic of um, diseases and sort of uh, risks. Um, I'm interested in uh, also schizophrenia. I don't know if you've like had yeah. any look at this. I mean, I I wonder um, what it is, even from an evolutionary perspective, and its prevalence among different sexes. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. I don't know as much about that um, as I do some other things. Um, both sexes get schizophrenia, but it tends to manifest a little bit differently earlier in guys than um, girls. Um, the guys are more likely to be kind of socially withdrawn, and the girls, uh, the, the, the females, might be a little more socially engaged. Um, it, it's related in, in part to some working memory and kind of um, inhib cognitive inhibitory problems. Um, we all kind of have a fantasy world, um, a way to generate scenarios and think about ourselves and integrate things in related to what's called the default mode network. And it's almost like they have trouble shutting down that network. So they're kind of always in a or at least a lot of times in kind of an imaginary state. But, interesting. Yeah. But I, I don't I don't know that that much about it. Okay. Okay. Interesting. You know, on this topic of looking kind of I guess you could say uh, the extremes and the vulnerabilities of um, like different like psychological disorders, you have a book called The Evolution of Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Um, I don't know if it's too complicated to sort of condense, but how does that relate to how are the sexes different in terms of how they're vulnerable? Yeah. So um, hi historically, there's been a notion of just kind of male vulnerability that <clears throat> men, boys and men are the vulnerable sex and people. And um, even Darwin mentioned that. And, and that's related in part to higher mortality rates at all ages for males than for um, females. My which is true, but, but my focus was basically on if you have an advantage in one area, that area is great, it's evolved, but those evolved systems have um, built-in risks associated with them. So if you have a, um, you know, a, you know, a 400 square meter flat <clears throat> that is gonna cost twice as much to build and maintain as a 200 square meter flat, and you begin to run out of resources, um, you're going to notice that, you know, keeping it heated or whatever it is in the more expensive, the larger flat than in the smaller one. And so, so let, let's take an example. We were talking earlier about height <clears throat> and size. So males are bigger than females. And it takes longer to get bigger, and it takes more resources overall to get bigger. For populations living under stressed conditions, with a lot of diseases, a lot of social stressors, poor nutrition, and so forth, the height of males is more compromised than the height of females. So the sex difference in height becomes smaller in difficult contexts, as living conditions improve, males get better quicker and the sex difference in height increases. <clears throat> Same right. thing. Oh. Go on. Same thing for f things that women are good at, at theory of mind, language processing, and so forth. They have advantages in this. <clears throat> but if there are problems during development or current problems or nutrition and so forth, they lose those advantages. Yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, like, Okay. the the things that um these these additional bonus things that that, pe that the different sexes are very good at you you like you only invest in them when you have the resources to do it right so like a male is bigger like so yeah they will be bigger if they have enough resources but then they they almost quickly you know get nearer to the the, the female size if if there's like a lack of resources and it's, right. and, and and i guess you know the obvious implication is like i guess in a world today when we have like uh, enough resources you 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 expect to see bigger differences and you interesting right yeah so in in modern context uh western world where you know there's there's medical care there's not a lot of parasites around there's lots of good things <clears throat> sex differences are larger in physical size they're larger in visual spatial abilities they're larger um in verbal memory that favors females and so forth. So a lot of sex differences as places become wealthier, healthier, uh, are becoming bigger. Interesting. I've, um, 
<clears throat> I've also heard that males they have they have like sort of um, fatter tails. You could say on on the distribution of traits, like they have more extremes, both high and good. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, good and bad. Like it's it's uh, the, the, there's some males that like a a very low intelligence, some that are very high. Whereas with the females, it's sort of the, a tighter distribution. Do you know why this would be the case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's a great question. It's probably not true for all traits, um, but it does seem to be true for some traits. Um, the IQ one has been studied for some time, and there's pretty good evidence that there is. That, that there are more males at the um, uh, you know at the high end and the low end of, of cognitive uh, ability. Been been a lot of uh, arguments about it related to X genes, where you know if you have um, uh, issues with that and you have two two X chromosomes, you got to back up there for females. Um, but I, it, it's not really resolved the the mm. the reasoning you know the mechanisms for that i made an argument based on um mitochondrial energy um uh, d you know uh, production so forth in an earlier arg uh, earlier article article but i i don't think it's uh, it's there but mm. exactly why it's not clear yet okay okay fascinating you talked about your interest in work in education education today and mm -hmm. and you and said that is a little related to sex differences so would you be able to speak about perhaps what we kind of the things we've talked about today and the implications for uh, our educational systems sure yeah so so one of the the arguments i've been making now for uh, close to 30 years is that when we look at kids cognitive development and academic development there's been a tendency, well, it's not more than a tendency. There, it, the field has kind of treated things like language and reading acquisition as basically the same thing, kind of a continuation of that. Um, and I've argued that we really need to make a difference, uh, a distinction between evolved abilities such as language, theory of mind, reading facial expressions, visual spatial abilities, and so forth and more recent cultural inventions like writing systems, mathematics, reading, and so forth. And that making that distinction allows us to understand why kids can easily acquire um, their native language, their, their bias to, to acquire that. There's built-in scaffolds in the brain and attentional systems and so forth that make sure that happens but then several years later, they may have trouble um, learning how to read, decoding unfamiliar words, sounding them out, so forth, building fluency in that. A bit of a conundrum until you say, well, you know, reading is an evolved system, <clears throat> is, is, not, is a non-evolved system, biologically secondary to evolved systems. And you need instruction in certain types of activities that kids don't normally do in order to acquire these skills. Mm, so if I get you correctly, you know, people might go, well, how big are the differences in males versus females in reading ability? Because look, all kids, they, they quickly learn their native language. And, and so, you know, what are you on about? But you need to distinguish between that, which is like a much longer evolutionary time span compared to like uh, skills like reading and, and, the, and more nuanced abilities, because actually that that's quite, quite, quite new. And these are quite like, technical sort of capacities we've sort of had to take on in our modern environment and then that's where you see differences is that right right yeah there there there's differences in the evolved systems as i said before some aspects right. of which in visual spatial <clears throat> but um things like universal education <clears throat> excuse me again difficult um un universal education are very very recent um you know in the u.s maybe 100 and you know, mid 19th century or so. And even then most people only went to school for six years and the long educational periods through secondary school is a very, very recent phenomenon. So we haven't evolved the systems that allow us to easily learn algebra or, you know, word uh, fluency, reading fluency and, and so forth. But sex differences in <clears throat> basic systems like language processing, language fluency, and so forth, 
can result in sex differences in the evolutionarily novel skills that are built on these primary ones. So, I mean, I, yeah, no, that, I mean, it's fascinating. I, I guess I would say I still find it kind of surprising that, um, say, <clears throat> our deeply evolved traits, like for, for males, for visual spatial abilities, and that that transfers to, say, like mathematical ability, whereas like for females, you know, and them and, and like reading and these more emotional abilities, like it, it's, it's surprising that it translates so much to our modern world. I mean, would you be able to speak to that? I mean, do you find it surprising? Like, what is the ability for us to transfer how we've uh, evolutionary theory and thinking about deep past to today. Right. Yeah. So, so the reading to language <clears throat> in theory of mind sort of thing is fairly transparent. So a lot of the reading skills are kind of mapped onto language skills and theory of mind skills, which would help you understand character development and plots and, and that sort of thing. You still have to build up that network so that you can easily transfer, you know, what's written on a page and into sounds and words and scenarios um, and so forth. Uh, and, and so girls advantage in these social cognitive skills, these evolved domains does seem to provide them an advantage in reading, which is very universal. It's, it's a moderate advantage. Um, there's a, they also have advantages in writing, which is actually a, a pretty large advantage there doesn't get talked about much. Now, how, how exactly evolved systems get transferred into mathematics is a much more complicated and much more difficult sort of thing. Reading is kind of a skill development type of thing. Mathematics is a whole entire field that emerged, um, you know, and fits and starts over the last several thousand years, the work of lots and lots of different people to put it together. And we don't fully understand how um, uh, math-related brain networks are built from these evolved systems. We have some some ideas, but it's not it's not fully mapped out as well as the reading is. Right. I mean, I mean, would some of those ideas consist of? Like, I guess, even if you just think about how, how one does mathematics, you are often like manipulating sort of visually in your, in your head, like moving around things. It's, you know, it's, you know, it, so is it something you, is it somewhat related to spatiotemporal um, manipulation, but it's just kind of hard exactly to say how it transfers. Right. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is related to, to, to visual spatial skills. You know, a lot of geometry obviously is, is, you know, it, it's a visual spatial types of things. <clears throat> okay. um, taking an algebraic equation and understanding how it maps to space, you know, like a linear line or, you know, a U-shaped line or curve or whatever it is, it has a visual spatial component to it. And the guys, when there are sex differences in math, it seems to be related to the, the areas of math that have a visual spatial component to it. Mm. Another interesting thing you mentioned is about how it's very recent invention that we stick kids into a classroom room and they have to learn for hours in a day. Would you be able to speak about that impact of that on kids? Yeah. Um, you know, sitting still in a classroom and, um, learning abstract evolutionarily novel sorts of things is, is a massive social intervention. It's basically trying to get kids to do things that they don't wouldn't normally do. Um, so that they acquire the skills they're going to need to be successful in a modern economy. And that's where a lot of the um, educational errors occur. I think there's a bias for a lot of educators to want to adapt educational practices to children's preferences, to you know, socialize and to play and so forth. But those preferences evolved to flesh out language skills, navigational skills, social competencies, and so forth. And those preferences have not evolved to facilitate the learning of mathematics or reading or so forth. So uh, in my opinion, you can't fully adapt educational practices to children's preferences. You have to... Um, change children's activities with more direct instruction, more organized instruction, lots of practice, lots of things they don't like, but are good for them in the long run. 
So, so like, I guess you, you must have done some work then on, like, how you could sort of change things for the better to, like, better map the, and the evolutionary fair. And you're saying, like, they need to be doing more rather than, like, can, like taking in and listening and watching someone else. Um, like, what are some other ways that uh, it, might, it might be a better evolutionary fit to change our educational system? Well, right, yeah. I mean, it, it depends on, on kind of the topic and it depends on how much you already know. But, but certainly kids who don't know much about a particular math or whatever, most of them do better with a pretty organized, structured, you know, the teacher shows them how to do it um, and explains it, and then they do a lot of practice. They maybe have examples to look at and so forth. So it's it's it would need to be, in most cases, much more structured, much more teacher-directed than... Um, many education professor types would like to believe mm, interesting interesting it's, i guess because i guess the way you describe it there like that's probably more that i did in like like high school whereas like in like university the way they they often teach you know they, they think all right let's just tell the students just give them a big lecture and mm -hmm. they probably understand it and they go off and now they know it and then i suppose that's yeah i mean it's interesting. Um, I, I suppose I find I've like like doing a podcast. <laughs> kind of need to ask questions and and uh, you could say practice it. I, I you know I've looked at those topics and now I'm asking you again. I mean, and if I were to just think I know it from looking at it once, probably don't. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You need a lot of practice. Once you develop a lot of expertise and if you're self motivated and pretty bright. Once you get the basics down, you can figure a lot of it out mm. on your own, looking things up and imitating people and doing that. Um, but, you know, not all kids are self-motivated or um, intellectually curious and so forth. And But they still need to know mathematics and learn to read mm. and write and that and uh, kind of more organized teacher-directed instruction is, is better for them. Interesting. I wanted to ask you about... A kind of a broader evolutionary question yeah. moving away from sex differences per se which is that i'm fascinated by how uh at least from humans and maybe it's with other species like it's very hard for us to lie about our physical traits like our eyes our pupils they 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 shows us where we're looking and of like you can't we can't like i guess with makeup I guess, but with our skin, we can't really cheat. You know, uh, we can't. Apparently, we can't like fake laugh. We can we can fake laugh, but people know that it's fake. So we're really good at that. So can you speak a bit about that? What, why? Because obviously, it's worse for me. I mean, maybe or maybe not. I don't know. I guess it might be better if I could lie and pretend and do things. But but like, so why has this evolved? Yeah, um, some people are, are very good at lying, actually, um, and they do cheat. I mean, the makeup okay. industry is based on changing your physical appearance to make to make you look um, uh, better than than you would without the makeup and that's related to competition and social mm. presentation and so forth so there a lot of that goes on Facebook you know changing uh, the images you know clearing them up facial features or whatever all of that so, so people have the motivation mm. to present themselves as being better uh, than they are. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of an arms race. You want to figure out what's going on with the other person. And if there's, you know, mutual trust and so forth, you can be very direct about it. But uh, oftentimes people have competing interests. And so what one person wants is not exactly what the other person wants. But if he or she says it directly, that's going to disrupt the relationship. And so you have to get some deception in there and then the other person has to kind of use theory of mind and other skills to make a judgment about whether that's correct or not now now physical traits height and so forth it's harder to do that but social intentions personal intentions and so forth uh there's a lot of dynamics going on there well it's helpful that you yeah characterize it as a bit of an arm race arms race because I, I probably was a bit naive then to say that because i mean obviously as you say like people can get really good at lying and especially in our like modern culture like there are actually so many ways that you can yeah change your physical appearance or the way right. that we just have like a an icons like say on social media and 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 then you're like um warping the people's perception even if it's not your physical person because people aren't seeing you physically you know so okay so it's it's very interesting i mean like um 
it's 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 fascinating that as well i there are, there are some incentives to me to do it so it's like against i guess for a whole species it would make sense that we it's like uh, at least our biological level it's like we have the pupils that we can see where people look and things because as you say like given that there are incentives to lie would you say that i suppose it would be the case that you kind of you need mechanisms so that it's like difficult and that you actually can truthfully read people's facial expressions and things like this is that would that be right yeah i mean it it's uh you know it's always a probabilistic type of thing so you're getting all of this information in <clears throat> if you're not sure you can trust the person then you have to make a judgment on it sometimes you're going to be right and sometimes you're going to be wrong and that's what happens with arms races it doesn't really settle into a um you know a situation where you're never deceived interesting um i i kind of wanted to ask because you've done some work on it about just uh, how evolutionary theory works sort of the modern conception of it um, by because there's something i was reading called modularity which is like how evolved traits sort of like work how they're selected upon so would you be able to speak about how uh, how this mod modularity, how traits work in evolutionary theory, and like how how different adaptations are selected for um, based on their fittedness? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Mo modularity in this whole thing, I think, has led to a lot of confusion. Um, I think of it in terms of there are brain networks that have built in biases to form so the language network is is very well um understood it's not like one area of the brain it's multiple areas of the brain that are kind of linked together um and work um synchronously uh to understand and process uh language so that we we can talk about as a module but but it's a, a very complex system of things um, in a in a technical <clears throat> kind of one view is the module is closed. You, you can't really modify it or so forth. But I, I think um, a lot of modules are modifiable. Plastic, uh, obviously, there's components of language that are modifiable in terms of the native language you're exposed to. That's the one you're going to learn. <clears throat> People, as we talked about before, the language system provides a foundation for reading and writing, so it can be adapted, you know, added on that network can be expanded and adapted and changed in ways that um, are evolutionarily novel. Um, there, there are probably multiple other networks as well related to things like um, uh, face processing, theory of mind, and so forth. They're, they're not as well understood as the language, but, but they're there. Right, so I guess the way it kind of works is we think that, say, say the brain, but just different different aspects of our biology. There are like certain uh, set features; they all will work together. You can say they act as a module, and then they go out and they're doing things. And yeah. and so so even that you know you say that with language, you could have it could have multiple uh, ways of working and multiple benefits. But like you could say some something like evolutionary changes can occur on modules, and that and that's how differences can can occur like you could have it for language you can have it for like facial recognition mm -hmm. um so kind of how it works yeah okay um yeah and, and you 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 can also boil it down to really smaller things so you can have aspects of the language system get expanded for processing um the details of language sound, sounds for example so it'd be kind of a sub module here can expand or contract or Mm. you said that kind of some people like maybe like got um confused or misunderstood it like um i mean i guess one i think i might have heard this before I mean, one one thing that kind of comes up is like what is the mapping between different biological traits in the world like how how can you how can you say that there's the definite definitive thing in in our body that maps on how who who's the one deciding that this trait I guess I don't know. It's like is it more random than the way we're saying where there are set modules? Maybe how can we how can we say there really are even set traits? Something like this as a counter argument. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So I I think the term module and how people think about it at an abstract level, uh, there's probably a tendency to think well that then is associated with one particular area of the brain that does this thing, but in reality, um, what it is is a network of areas 
that work together to give some functional skill like language or face processing or whatever. And parts of that system might be used in other modules as well. Interesting. So, so modularity makes sense in that we have various different parts of biology that will like work together in unison for different tasks. But it's not like you can say that small little bit of the brain is is right. is, is doing that exact task. Which right. okay, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah. So, on. so yeah, yeah. I mean, one way to think about okay, what's a cognitive module? You look at skills that seem to be human universals: um, language, reading, facial expressions, gesture. Um, navigational skills and so forth. Although, you know, there's variation in, of course, the languages we speak and sensitivity to facial expressions and so forth, but those systems are all there, um, you know, across uh, human cultures. But things like mathematics, writing, reading systems and so forth are spotty. They're not human universes. Interesting. What would you say to people who might say, why should we thinking be thinking about our deep evolutionary past? Our modern environment is so much different now, and like we we kind of we've changed, and like it's not relevant, and we can kind of do what we want, and like yes, you know, like sex differences, like that they don't matter, but you know, even more broadly, like what do you what do you think about that? Like how relevant is our deep past to now? Well, I mean, we we just just talked about that a bit. Um, by thinking about our deep past in our modern society, we understand why schooling is so difficult for a lot of kids and why kids have to go through, you know, 12 or 16 years or however many years of schooling just to be ready to be an adult when they do nothing like that in traditional societies. And so if we assume, I mean, the whole language um, fiasco started because um, a lack of understanding of the difference between evolved biases and um, modern skill development. So the assumption was that reading development is just a continuation of language development. And all we need to do is provide the materials, books and you know picture books and other th sorts of things and set kids free. And they'll naturally pick up reading skills just like they picked up their language skills. Um, and, and, and that was wrong and, and had negative consequences for a lot of people. Interesting. And, you know, with modern schooling, to come back to that again, do males or females find that harder or is it sort of the same? <clears throat> um, it, it's harder for boys. Mm -hmm. uh, boys are physically more active than girls, just in natural settings. Um, they're not as attentive to social cues and speech, you know, attentive to the teacher. And so sitting still and focusing on um, somebody talking to you and explaining things is much more difficult for younger, uh, younger boys, especially mm. than uh, younger girls. How do we test evolutionary theory sort of in our present day like for like, what kind of empirical tests are going on right because it's it's hard to kind of look back and observe i guess there's also fossils and things but what kind of things are people doing to try and test the reasons for why different mm -hmm. traits have evolved mm -hmm. yeah so looking at um things like uh so some uh, 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 some of the things i i talk about say okay the sex difference in physical size that can't be argued away that we know exists. Um, we know the upper body differences. We know what guys are good at. We can then look at male male competition in traditional societies. So a lot of blunt force weapons. There's a lot of um, before kind of uh, the missionaries came in and stuff. There was a lot of violence between groups and within groups and so forth. High male mortality rate. Um, all of it will be argued about, but all of it's pretty well documented. If we look at uh, fossil bones in um, Neanderthals and in early uh, humans, we see many more kind of forearm fractures and head fractures in males than females. Quite a few in Neanderthals, about 20%, about 10% mm. uh, in males. And that's just, you know, getting hit with clubs and stuff and so a lot of physical male male um competition there 
that predicts that males should be more aggressive, more externalizing, acting out, more prone uh, to violence, more focused on status related types of things, uh, more concerned about kind of where they are in the hierarchy. Um, it leads to all, all sorts of, um, and, and then the polygonous background, which you see in traditional societies, would lead to sex differences, predicted sex differences in um, uh, desire for sex, desire for multiple partners, levels of investment in relationships and kids and so forth. So they're just from mm -hmm. that one component of male-male competition it leads to a whole host of integrated hypotheses that have been tested um, over and over again. Very interesting. Okay, well, I, I've i loved this interview. I don't have any more questions. So I, any last words that, that you want to say and where can people find your work or, you know, go for it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the interview. Thank you for, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, I don't do social media because, um, you know, I'm busy and not really into that. Um, but I, I do have a University of Missouri website that has a list of recent articles and books and stuff. So you, you, you can get on that. If you're interested in any particular article or topic or whatever you you can just e email me at, at my university address and I'll, I'll respond to it okay awesome all right thank you very much great thank you